slides are visible yes sir and now they are full screen yes yeah. sir now it is yes slide show so my today's talk is uh, uh, is on pharmacotherapy in gestational diabetes and before i proceed uh, let me uh, humbly uh, congratulate and thank dr rajiv chawla dr shalini jaggi and the whole team of international symposium in diabetes uh, which is being uh, actually conducted from delhi and of course my cherished first to uh, to dr seshaya uh, my regards to dr balaji dr hema devakar the current president and pk and the whole team members as including the chairperson dr bhavatharani there is no conflict of interest for this particular session so we have the discussion on uh, some slides on introduction which i don't think will be too much because we all our earlier two speakers including dr sheshaya and dr balaji have already covered it i'll directly proceed to the pharmacotherapy in hyperglycemic pregnancy first part will be on on oral drug and then we'll be talking on insulin therapy and the carry home message i feel uh, the uh, this slide is also being shown earlier that we have the recent classification by figo where you have hip hyperglycemia and pregnancy which is a umbrella term uh, which has uh, two uh, sub classes which is gestational diabetes i'll just use the pen uh, marker here if yeah so you have gestational diabetes which is uh, which classically appears during pregnancy and an 85 to 90% patient will disappear after delivery and there will be another class of patient where which will be diabetes in pregnancy which could be a pre existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes which are getting pregnant and another group will be diagnosed for the first time during pregnancy but actually it is an earlier no earlier unknown case which is classically presents to you as as pre existing diabetes now commonly it will be type 2 diabetes rarely it can be even type 1 diabetes so when we talk about the pharmacotherapy in such individuals the the, the thought process and the approach changes in in pure gestational diabetes versus diabetes in pregnancy or dip category so we will just see this case in very very brief and a young woman a 25 years work in in, in pune and she has a anc of 26 primary gravida one uh, almost normal weight negative family history of diabetes no other significant past history clinical examination normal i feel we have just heard from the horse's mouth will you screen this case and we have come to know from dr balaji and dr sheshaya that yes every woman should be in india should be screened for diabetes irrespective of the symptoms irrespective of the risk factors irrespective of the family history irrespective uh, of the uh, of the of the uh, of the uh, uh the uh, boh or or anything or obesity or bmi so we have to uh, screen each and every women at the first given opportunity so like we have a government of india guidelines of dipc 75 gram glucose gct was given and 2 hour has come to 136 which classically defined that it is not gdm but it is certainly above 120 targets which uh, which which dr balaji has told you hbavc normal but the urine sugar sometimes may positive it is renal glycosuria which is common in pregnancy now what is the diagnosis so we have uh, in 2006 classification published in j j japi uh, by dipsy that we have more than 240 140 it is gestational diabetes but if it is between 120 to 140 um, in gct it is called as ggi uh, different bodies across the globe speak out different terminology for this some of the uh, uh, countries they name it as mild mild gdm some of them they have called it as igt in pregnancy and some of them have said isolated abnormality and blood glucose and dipsy has decided to put in, in india as ggi and such cases should be certainly put on uh, on the treatment and the follow up and many of them may become gd in future but the important is that such patient if remain untreated might create a, a problem because the targets are about uh, the, the the blood sugars are above uh, the targets and most and, and india all women with pregnancy is being celebrated so pregnancy is, is a celebration in our country if you call it as is negative possibly these women will be subjecting themselves to uh, gct more often and they will remain hyperglycemic and they may be missed out so this patient uh, uh, has blood sugar has uh, the diagnosis made as gestational glucose intolerance with renal glycosuria and she was given uh, the targets of 90 and 120 and mean to uh, which which was uh, which was addressed by simple medical nutrition therapy and and the exercise and she could achieve her goal 
Then the when you talk about the targets, MNT and, and, and the lifestyle modification, which includes physical activity and exercise, if they don't do well within two weeks of uh, uh, of the medical nutrition therapy and exercise, if you fail to achieve your targets in GDM, then you need to start the pharmacotherapy. So after two weeks of trial of MNT and LSM, this uh, this young woman could achieve good glycemic control and have, have proceeded and then monitoring and everything was done. And she proceeded, uh, the outcome was good. And she had a normal 3 kg male child without any complication to mother and the, but the, but the actions were taken well in time and uh, she could be, she could have a good uh, neat neonatal outcome with, of course, a concept of primordial pre prevention, which we have just learned from the, from Dr. Seshaya. So after two years, the same uh, GGI woman, ABC, and now she's 27. Now she presented with 18 weeks of second pregnancy. Uh, weight now she has gained around 10 kg of weight in between. And now she presented with a typical case of GDM uh, uh, after uh, G, uh, 75 gram uh, GCT. Now she has 168. No associated comorbidities. The rest everything is normal. After two weeks of medical nutrition therapy, this young girl has now still has uh, two hours is 150. 80 is fasting, which is classically seen in GDM, where your fasting usually is normal, and two hour postprandial is high, which is which high and that need to be addressed. So if it is a pure gestational diabetes, classically it presents to you with postprandial hyperglycemia. That does not mean there will not be an exceptions. There will be few cases which might also present to you with associated fasting hyperglycemia. Now, what should you choose? Uh, uh, the next drug, the oral versus the insulin therapies. So let's talk about the oral glucose lowering therapy. Whenever you use oral drug, you should know that uh, the drug should uh, have two important uh, properties. One is ideally, a drug should not cross the placenta. Insulin doesn't cross the placenta. All oral drugs, including metformin, sulfonylurea, uh, glibenclamide, any any drug you say and that crosses the placenta. Insulin doesn't cross the placenta. The oral drug, which if, even if cro it crosses the placenta, it should not be causing the hypoglycemia, hyperinsulinemia in the baby, and it should not have teratogenic effect. If you have these three properties, we call it that this particular oral drug is safe for pregnancy. Now, we have three drugs which have been approved uh, globally, metformin, glabenclamide, and acarbose. In India, we have got the approval for, uh, or the, or the uh, government of India guidelines says, uh, talks about only metformin. Glebenclavant is not being used in our country, though in parts might be people are using off-label. Acarbose is again not being properly, not being studied in our population as well as glebenclamide and so not, not being used regularly. But glebenclamide is a drug which is quite commonly used in, in US population as well as uh, South Africa population. We have some reservations which data has come from metformin. Uh, that neonatal, this is a meta-analysis uh, 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 which has shown that the uh, that uh, intrauterine exposure to metformin for the treatment of GDM, the neonates were significantly smaller than the neonates whose mothers were treated with insulin. Now, uh, despite lower birth weight, there was a catch up growth in the in the early childhood. And this phenomena of low birth weight and postnatal catch up growth uh, has been reported to be associated with cardiometabolic uh, outcome, uh, adverse uh, long term cardiometabolic outcome. That means increased risk of obesity and cardiovascular disease. Now, this concept has raised some questions and then there were some other, other papers, uh, which again, hardly three or four years back, they said that the fetal concentration of metformin are equal to the maternal and the metformin can inhibit the growth can suppress the mitochondrial respiration, can have epigenetic modification the gene expression, can mimic the uh, fetal nutrient restriction and alter the postnatal gluconeogenic response. Because both the placenta as well as fetus, they express metformin transporters and exhibit high mitochondrial activity. These properties of metformin raise an important question about the developmental programming of the metabolic disease in the, in the offspring. But then uh, to, to, to counter this, we had another paper, which is a clinical data, which is MITI trial, where MITI trial is a known type 2 uh, uh, women, uh, already known type 2 diabetic women, and they have been subjected to metformin before conception of continued till delivery. And they have also come out with a, with a data that metformin treated women achieve better glycemic control, required less insulin, gained less weight, and had fewer caesarean deliveries. Compared with placebo, uh, placebo Metformin-exposed infants weighed less, 
metformin exposed infant had reduced adiposity measures at the time of birth but there was high proportion of small for gestational age babies in the metformin group versus the insulin group but on the basis of this particular trial in the earlier data from europe recently european organization has approved this drug to be used in pregnancy throughout what does the government of india says it says that metformin or insulin is the acceptable medical therapy for the pregnant women with gdm not controlled on mnt now insulin is the first drug of choice and metformin can be considered after 20 weeks of gestation for medical management of gdm i when it if it is polycystic ovarian disease we everyone allows up to 12 weeks of gestation and there is no additional benefit of continuation of the metformin in cases of polycystic ovarian disease for prevention of gdm or for prevention of abortion after 12 weeks and that's why it has been recommended to withdraw metformin after 12 weeks now government of india approves it after 20 weeks and recent uh, uh, dipsy guideline says uh, from the uh, from the 16 uh, weeks also we can give it now insulin can be started any time during the pregnancy for gdm so insulin can be given at any any weeks of pregnancy a pregnant woman with gdm before uh, before 20 weeks then uh, the the med medical nutrition therapy failed insulin should be started so very clearly government of india guidelines has said that if the if the gdm is diagnosed before 20 weeks better we start insulin therapy metformin can be started at 20 weeks if mnt has failed to control her blood glucose and uh, uh, the maximum dose could be 2 g per day uh, and the insulin can be added if they if they are not controlled on metformin alone this is what has been shown in even mic trial that 50% of the women who were sub, who were on metformin arm required additional insulin therapy to achieve the glycemic targets hypoglycemia and weight gain with metformin are less compared to insulin if insulin is required in high dose metformin can be added as a, can be an add on treatment to have a, to counter the insulin resistance uh, in such women so this is the recommendation from government of india and this is what i is talking about the 28 february 2022 european working uh, workshare procedure uh, uh, has approved the first oral uh, glucose medicine that is metformin uh, even from the conception to the birth and uh, this has again uh, actually increased uh, has ad added the confidence on this drug which is being loved and being being uh, for uh, being uh, uh, taken as a primary drug by most of the obgyns across the country what about salvinuria they are known to cross the placenta and have been associated with increased risk of neonatal hypoglycemia the concentration of this glabenclamide in umbilical cord is at almost 50 to 70% of the maternal level glaburide or glabenclamide was associated with higher rate of neonatal hypoglycemia and macrosomia than insulin or metformin and glabenclamide failed to uh, be uh, failed to be found to inf non inferior to insulin based on the composite outcome of neonatal hypoglycemia macrosomia and hyperbilirubinemia so it has not shown additional advantages over insulin and unfortunately there is no long term safety data available uh, of glabur glaburide versus even metformin you have at least up to 11 years of age of data available for metformin so this abc was then uh, put on metformin uh, twice a day because there was no contraindication for metformin but and but she could not really achieve post breakfast 126 post lunch 136 post dinner still high so all three post meal were higher a fasting was normal and most metformin once the dose was increased she could not tolerate the increased dose of metformin so maximum tolerated dose for metformin in ab in this women was only 1 g and ultimately we have to we have two choices one is to add and uh, some another old drug like glabenclamide if she doesn't want to have insulin or a carbos or to initiate insulin now let it be very very clear my dear delegates that there is no recommendation globally to add another drug so do two drugs in pregnancy two oral drugs in pregnancy is not being recommended across so never ever add another oral drug to metformin if you want to encourage it could be either glabenclamide alone or it could be metformin alone <laughs> so in such cases insulin remains the drug of choice in addition to metformin insulin there are some absolute indication if you have high hb1c ketonuria uh, uh, renal dysfunction hepatic dysfunction obstetric morbidity like macrosomia iugr hydromnias or uh, deterioration in the glycemic control and if you are giving steroid therapy uh, in insulin becomes a drug of choice 
uh, though the topic is on GDM, but still I'll cover some of the important topic, which is Indian data, uh, which might help you in your clinical practice. This is our own uh, original data of pre-existing type 2 diabetic women. And this data of around 101 pregnancy. And we have shown that pre-GDM type 2 diabetic women are requiring around 0.5 unit per kg body weight in the first trimester. And by third trimester, it has increased to almost 0.7 That's almost 0.8 unit per kg body weight of their pre-pregnancy weight. So all type 2 diabetic might need the doses in, uh, near to these doses because this is the Indian data for which actually uh, uh, matches or which might be approved for its use in Indian population. When it comes to GGIs, it is uh, those who are requiring insulin might require 0.1 unit, uh, GDM might require 0.25 and pre-GDM require around 0.5 unit per kg body weight of their pre-pregnancy weight in the first trimester, which gradually increased to uh, almost uh, one and a half times of their basal uh, requirement to 0.15. Here it is 0.4 and 0.8 unit. Now, insulin regimen, it best is basal bolus therapy whenever you require it. In gestational diabetes, you will require only prandial insulins. If you are using premixed insulin, one should also keep a close watch on the nocturnal hypoglycemia because in, in pure gestational diabetes, your fasting usually is normal. So in such situation, better to use prandial insulin, maybe twice a day or thrice thri a day, depending on the requirement. In our own population in Central India, we have found the post-dinner dose uh, of the pre-dinner dose of, of the insulin is highest versus the breakfast and the lunch dose. So if someone requiring say seven, six units in the, in the, in the, at the breakfast time, they require around seven to eight, seven to eight units in the lunch and they might require eight to 10 units in the dinner time. So uh, almost, almost one and a half times to double dose at the dinner time versus the versus the pre-breakfast dose of insulin and that has to be so that has to be closely monitored but only it's only self-monitoring of blood glucose which will dictate and which will actually guide you where to use which insulin and how much the dose can be can be taken but unfortunately many of the clinicians never monitor post dinner blood glucose they do monitor post breakfast and sometimes post lunch or sometimes only one but ideally they should be monitoring fasting post breakfast post lunch primarily and if you are pre existing type 1 or type 2 you should also be monitoring pre lunch pre dinner and 3am blood glucose on a regular basis which insulin is safe so we have regular insulin uh, as well as aspart, lispro and detimir, uh, which is being safe. Fasting aspart, fast uh, fast acting aspart uh, controls postprandial better than the than the uh, earlier aspart. So it could could be also a good choice. There's one data coming from Degludec. The use of Degludec during pregnancy resulted in similar pregnancy outcome as that of the <laughs> other long acting <clears throat> insulin. But this was not a randomized control trial. This is observational data emphasis of on HMBG should be given. Insulin in twin pregnancy, and we have presented this data earlier also, that insulin requiring, this is a paper from, from US, that they have observed in type 1 diabetic twin pregnancy, they are requiring almost double the dose as that of the singleton pregnancy in type 1 women. Unfortunately, we did not find from, from our uh, database uh, from our center and Dr. Sanjay Gupta's center from Pune, uh, we did not have any patient of type 1 twin pregnancy, but we certainly had GDM women with twin pregnancy. And we had tried to evaluate the treatment strategy and the pregnancy outcome uh, in the, in the uh, GDM women with twin pregnancy. And they had been compared with GDM singleton pregnancy. And we concluded that GDM women in India with twin or singleton gestation differed insignificantly with their treatment strategies, whether it's insulin or diet. Insulin requirement need not be proportional to the number of fetuses and treatment should be planned to achieve a good glycemic control. That So insulin doses should be individualized and it, there cannot be a real mathematics what has been shown in, in type 1 diabetes from the Caucasian's paper. Intrapres Sunil, have, yeah, this is the last two, three slides. I'll finish up. Your targets intrapartum should be 70 to 120. Sometimes you may need to use the infusion. Postpartum follow-up uh, should be should be taken uh, aggressively and that has been discussed. So rule of six, six days, six weeks and six months, you should be subjecting these women for GCT. Breastfeeding should be encouraged and during breastfeeding, which drug should be uh, should be used? So glipizide and metformin. The last slide the long-term outlook of the offspring of diabetic mother, the primordial prevention. If the glycemic control can be maximized to the extent that the fetus no longer recognizes that its mother has diabetes, 
Then the treatment of mother during pregnancy may become the first step in prevention of obesity and diabetes in the offspring. With this, I stop here. Thank you very much for your patience listening.